Ava Homa is an award-winning author of Daughters of Smoke and Fire, a journalist and an activist. Her words have appeared in The Globe and Mail, Guardian, BBC, New Statesman, Literary Hub, Toronto Star, Literary Review, Review of Canada, and many more outlets. She holds a master's degree in English and creative writing from the University of Windsor in Canada, and another in English language and literature from Tehran, Iraq. She was born and raised in the Kurdistan province and now lives here in California. Her debut novel, Daughters of Smoke and Fire, won the 2020 Silver Nautilus Award for fiction and was shortlisted for the 2022 William Sarayan Writing Prize. Her collection of short stories, Echoes from Up the Other Land, was nominated for the 2011 Frank O'Connor Short Story Prize and secured a place among the 10 winners of the 2011 CBC Reader's Choice Contest running concurrently with the Giller Prize. Homa is also the inaugural recipient of the Penn Canada Humber College Writers in Exile Scholarship. Please welcome Ava Homa. Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for sharing your Tuesday afternoon with us. Um, thank you to the organizers, Masheed, Marlena, and everyone else working hard really behind the scenes to bring us together today. And uh, thanks to Andrew for that thought-provoking speech that, that makes it very hard for me to follow what he said. <laughs> we'll try. So um, we're gathered here today in honor of peace and education. And if we zoom that down into what is happening in Iran, I stand before you today in honor of a peaceful, unarmed population that is standing up against a very violent state. They have been asking for justice, and what that they have received in turn has been bullets, arrests, tortured, and televised confession. People have been taken to the streets chanting, woman, life, freedom. That's the theme <coughs> of what they're fighting for, and that's the theme of my talk tonight. Woman, life, freedom. In its power, in its regional and global power, that chant is parallel to French Revolution's uh, slogan of liberté, égalité, fraternité. But this one is a lot less patriarchal. So today I would like to share, shed a brief light on what is happening. I don't want to go over what media has already told you. Um, I would like to look at two parallel events that have been going on, two parallel movements of the Iranian women's movement and the Kurdish women movement that have been independently working for over a century. But what is happening today is that for the first time, these movements have merged and empowered each other. And at the end, I'm going to look at different forms that protests take and how that has affected literary creation. I built my talk today on the famous quote that I think all of us in this room and online love, and that's the quote by Martin Luther King that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And today, more than any other time in our life, we feel that in our bones, especially post-pandemic, that became very clear. Um, my talk is building around, more built around how a movement, a step toward justice here today by us can empower justice everywhere, not just for us, but also for the future generation. So what happened was in the September of this year, a 22-year-old Kurdish-Iranian woman named Jina Amini, officially known as Mahsa Amini, um, visited Tehran with her family. She was probably hoping to go to a museum, watch a show, um, watch the foliage, enjoy her time. And what happened was that she was arrested uh, for improper hijab. And what does that mean? What is improper hijab? She wasn't walking down the streets naked. She was, her hair and body was covered. She was showing a few strands of hair. Because of that, she was arrested. And then she died under unclear circumstances. Um, let me repeat this. A young 22-year-old Kurdish woman, while traveling, was killed over a few strands of hair. 
she was covered, but not exactly to the degree that some clergy had envisioned her coverage. Ever since her death, three groups of people in Iranian society <coughs> have been taken to the street, and she embodied all those three, the youth, women, and ethnic minorities. These are the three groups at the forefront of the protest today. The protest started at her funeral. It was in a very small, impoverished city called Saka in the Kurdish region, where her mom cried and called out her name, Gina. Gina has the same roots as the words woman, Jin, and light, Jian. It's in her funeral that people started chanting Jin, Jian, Azadi, life, woman, freedom, that was that spread across Iran and all over the globe. Her name, Gina, meant a giver of life, and she gave life even in death. September, September 19 wasn't the first time that Kurds rose up against the government. In fact, they were the only group that have opposed the Islamic Republic since its very inception 44 years ago. But at the time when they rose up against this government and IRI attacked, IRI means Islamic Republic. I don't want to keep repeating their names, so that's what they are, IRI. <coughs> they attacked Kurdish towns and looted their houses and their stores and shot fathers before the white eyes of their children, the rest of Iran stayed silent. 43 years ago, they didn't understand how injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. What is beautiful about what's happening this year is that a lot of young men are also following women on the streets. They're comfortable chanting for women, life, freedom. They are comfortable chanting in support of other ethnic minorities. The burden that these young men carry is heavy because they have to make up for what their fathers and their grandfathers failed to do. Today they make bonfires and women toss their headscarves ceremoniously into these bonfires to show with flames and with action that the rule of religion, theocracy, and its ensuing divisiveness and misogyny is not something that this generation is going to tolerate. Headscarves themselves have had a very long and complicated history in Iran. They have represented different things. There is a group of people who believe it's a sign of anti-colonialism, others see it as a sign of backwardness. People see it as a sign of misogyny, as a sign of progressiveness, it's a sign of subversion, subservience, all of that. At the end of the day, it's not a piece of clothing that in and of itself offer any meaning. It's the wearer who imbues it with meaning. And today, by burning their headscarves, women are offering that meaning. They're demanding freedom and equality. These women are really, really brave, but they stand on the shoulder of giants. They come from a generation of women who have been fighting for equality. Iranian women's fight for freedom and equality started in 1910 with the Constitutional Revolution era. In 1930, women had 14 magazines discussing their rights. It started in theory with changing minds, and by 1970, Iranian women enjoyed freedom of occupation and education. Well, the pendulum swung like it does in human history. In 1979, IRI other power, and they basically took back everything that women had fought for decades to achieve. Misogyny was justified in the name of religion and the law officially denied women the rights to have much control over their own lives in choosing what to wear, where to work, where to travel to, and even the right to keep the to have custody over their own flesh and blood, their children. Women didn't stay quietly and take it. Hijab became mandatory in stages. In 1980, before all of these lives, laws were fully mandated, women in Tehran took to the streets. They staged a very large scale protest and said no to all of this. What happened at the time, society failed to support them. The men failed to see that how people in power were establishing 
their agendas by subjugating female bodies. They fail to see that the same strategy would extend to male bodies as well. The silver lining to all of that is that women haven't given up. Today, more than 60% of college graduates in Iran are women, and education is the power. That's a little bit about how women within the territorial integrity of Iran have been fighting for their rights, for the right to ha gain equality. The other movement that has been going on at the same time is the Kurdish women's movement. This one is not limited to one country because Kurds live in four different countries, Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. Even though there is sometimes this false belief that gender equality is a Western phenomenon, it's actually <coughs> not true. Any look at the history of our region shows that there have been at least periods of time when women have been respected and allowed to be active in society. In fact, a lot of Western travel writers, when they were visiting Ottoman Empire and Persian Empire, they were surprised by how outspoken Kurdish women were, by how comfortable Kurdish men were in obeying female rulers and female governors. And at the time, this was unheard of. Kurdish women, just like their Persian sisters, have been struggling. The first Kurdish women organization was established in 1919 in Istanbul. The second one was established in 1946 in Iran during the Mahabad Republic. In fact, the equality was so much part of the, um, this republic that it became part of their constitution. Chapter 4, Article 21 officially called for women and I quote, in all political, economic, and social affairs, women should enjoy equal rights with men. That day they had 16 speakers, two of them were women. Both of them called for other women's education empowerment. So this movement has been going on for over a century, but this is the first time we see how beautifully they merge and empower each other. And that's how this slogan became the heart of the protest, the movement. Women like freedom has its roots in the Kurdish movement. In fact, it's interesting to know that this slogan was first chanted in Syrian Kurdistan on an international women's march. And the term was coined by a Kurdish leader in Turkey. In 1999, he's been in jail since then, but he shifted something about the overall Kurdish resistance movement by bringing this insight into the people. He's the first pe person who said a country won't be free until women are. That wasn't easy, that shifted the entire movement because for a very long time, a lot of these national movements would put women's rights movement on the back burner, saying this is not our priority now, one thing at a time. But then he created this awareness that all of these things should go hand in hand, otherwise there would be no true freedom. This is how we win by appreciating and supporting parallel movements because this is what oppressors have been done for centuries. They copy each other comfortably and don't hesitate to use each other's tactics to suppress freedom. It's remarkable, and I would like to repeat this today, people taking on the streets, they are no longer afraid of state violence. How is that possible? The strongest instinct in all of us is the instinct to survive. But these people have had so much that they no longer fear arrest. They no longer fear bullets. But there is something that I am concerned about. I've been thinking about what Franklin Roosevelt said, that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. To me, the path of Iran's freedom will go through the three segments of society that Gina represented. The youth, the women, the ethnic minority. Historically, these three groups have been marginalized. But the only thing now that can hijack this revolution is those limiting beliefs, fear of these three groups. I'm advocating for embracing these historically marginalized segments because a society can start, that can start reckoning and reconciliation is a society that's preparing for true democracy and freedom. And without these three groups, it's not going to happen. As internet shutdown in Iran has left little to the cameras to record and to the mainstream media to report on, 
I'd like to remind us, remind us that taking to the street is not the only form of protest, it's just one form. Movements have their own intelligence and they shift shapes based on the realities on the ground. And this is a very sensitive time. One of the ways that women in Iran have protested has been through their writing and literature. We all know that Persian classical literature is rich with poets like Hafez and Rumi that are internationally translated and revered. That's beautiful. Iran is a better place because of them. The world is a better place because of them. The problem was that Iranian men hold a monopoly over literature. And as a result of that, they deprived us from a lot of powerful female voices. Literary representation of women was limited to beautiful mouth and lip, and as a result of that, society lacked access to an authentic female world. Uh, and there was no dialogue between the genders because there was no access to what it's like to be a woman. But Iranian women are very intelligent. Although their voices have been muffled and their bodies have been barred from public spheres for centuries, they learned long ago to unveil themselves through the written word. It's no coincidence that the first Iranian woman who ever removed her headscarf in public was a poet. She first liberated her, vo her voice through the written word, and then she was brave enough to show up in a man's gathering in Bahdash, Mazandaran and she created an uproar among the scandalized beholders. Her name was Tahira Qodatul Ain. In 1850, she showed up at the gathering without a headscarf. Can you guess men's reaction? <laughs> <laughs> Some of them just fled from the blasphemy that she embodied. One of the men raised her sword toward her. Some of them covered their ears, some of them covered their eyes, and my favorite was a man named Abdul Khalaq Asfani. He cut his own throat because he couldn't possibly bear the disgrace. <laughs> Tahir was executed in 1852 after four years in prison at the time when there was no prison for women. Home was their prison. She's just the first of many, many women who have paid a price for rejecting their assigned place. Female writers in Iran have long been punished for their transgression. A room of one's own, eh? Isn't that what Virginia Woolf said? That a woman needs some privacy and some financial independence to be able to write. Iranian women lacked both, and they still wrote. What is ironic about this whole thing is in 1980, as hijab was becoming mandatory in stages, women actually tended, started writing more and more. And between 1983 and 1985, 126 books by women and about women were published despite heavy censorship and despite a shortage of paper. This is what I'm talking about, the intelligence of the movement. They really manifest themselves in different ways. Now this story of self-liberation through writing is a story that I know because it's my story too. When I found my voice through writing, I literally liberated myself. I saw how writing exposes and reveals how it overcomes obstacles and walls and reaches beyond the writer to engage with the world. It became my means of reflection and exploration, leaving little to ambiguity or stereotyping and basically undoing everything that forced veiling had done. But for every page that I have read, I have written, I have read a thousand. And as I looked for my own reflection in Persian literature and later as I learned English, in world literature in English, I saw that no one had written a Kurdish woman in literature. And I had to do that. We have to do it ourselves. That's when I won admission and scholarship to earn my master's degree and went to Canada to study creative writing. That was 2007. And ever since I've been writing in exile. The book I'm going to read for you from is Daughters of Smoke and Fire that took me a very long time to write. Um, it's urgent today because the protagonist, Leila, just like Gina, whose death sparked all this protest and movement, is Kurdish Iranian. 
And it is also a book that offers an access to the reality of being a Kurdish woman in Iraq, which is something even Iranians have access to, let alone the Western world. So Leila is interested in films and arts in general. She's dreaming of taking the stories of her people on the stage. Uh, but one day her younger brother, Chia, attends a protest. They have been going on for a very long time in Iran. And uh, during this protest, Chia is kidnapped and detained. And then it falls on Leila to find answers and to save him. And she puts her own life in danger while doing that. Um, usually when I read from Daughters, I read a segment by Leila, but I decided today that in honor of all those brave Iranians who are behind, the, behind bars right now as we speak, to read a page for you that's set in a prison and another page that's set in a court. Um, as I read this, I'll play a few seconds of a Kurdish lullaby for you, and there are two reasons. One reason is that when Chia, that this segment is, is in Chia's ways. When Chia feels helpless in soothing himself and other prisoners, he starts singing this. It helps him, it helps others. The other reason that it's just a beautiful Kurdish song that you can enjoy, and it also helps me clarify chapter breaks, and it gives you a chance to pause and take in what you've heard. The call to prayer that reverberates through Evan prison turns me cold with fear. <clears throat> Footsteps. I know the sound of those heavy boots. I know them well. I hear the iron doors open and shut. Hear the jiggle of the guard's huge keychain. Then another metal door opens and shut, and yet another. The footsteps grow louder. I drop my pen and curl into a ball, shrinking with fear. Three more doors, and then they will reach mine. The pain in my head and face, legs and back, stomach and ribs sharpen. Clutching at the pillow does not stop me from shaking. The footsteps stop before they reach my cell. Hands up. I think and almost say it loud. Hands up, the old god says. I know what they're doing in the other cell, a blindfold, a click of the handcuffs, and the guards take Ali out, pushing and kicking him. I follow them in my head as Ali is taken downstairs, dragged 19 steps to the right, down 15 more stairs, and delivered to the interrogators. Under his blindfold, Ali will count the shoes in the room, four, six, eight, black form of shoes splattered with blood, polished by blood. The whipping will start soon after the curse. If the man they call Mongrel is there, the interrogation would be longer. Five, six lashes in, and Ali will start thinking about concentration camps, the pyramids, the Great Wall of China. He will not feel the whip anymore, I hope. The number of cracks on the wall, number three or five today. Men in prison blue smocks drag their white flip-flops on the ground. The stairs creak. dull light, the still toilet in my solitary cell stinks. In me, there was a rough prisoner not used to the clanking of his chains. I recite, clinging to the door of my cell, a space that's only five paces wide, wall to wall. 
Through the bars, Ali looks so dried up, so weak, but his voice is firm. Shamlu's palms again. What could be more healing, I asked. Not your own poetry then, I wondered. Oh, I'm not a poet. I have not seen myself in months. Mirrors do not exist in prison, but I'm sure I don't look much better than Ali. I turn my head towards him, the head that is stuck between the iron rods. Ali mirrors me and winces. I know that under the prison gown, his body is a web of scars from all the wounds he has sustained. Mine is too. What would you do to them, Chia? Ali's voice is shaking. His cheeks and eyes are bruised and his muscles still. What would you do if you could do anything you wanted to the sadist? I think about his question for a while. I'd send them to rehab. <laughs> Ali forces a laugh. Does your foot still hurt? My entire body does, Ali Kian, but this is the pain of a nation and the cure too, so it's not all that bad. Make sure you don't forget us when you freed. Ali's voice grows fainter. Even though his body is stronger than mine, I know he's too frail to stand and speak much longer. I spent 18 days in an emergency room after my open sores from the interrogation sessions became infected. I was barely allowed to sleep, not allowed to use the washroom more than twice in 24 hours, and was kept in cold lockdowns. All I had to wrap around me was a once white mat. They must have played football with Ali too, the interrogators, the players. They stand in different corners of the room, call us enemies of God, order us to strip, kick our bodies around, curse us, kick our heads, kick us harder where we're already injured, threaten our families, threaten to rape us, and we cannot stifle the screams that satisfy them so much. Do not worry, Ali Kian. I write down what I cannot say to his face. Your cries are not a sign of weakness. I have seen a child's birth. Cries and struggles are the first sign of life, not of weakness. A mountain begins with its first rocks and human with the first pain. I sing the lullaby that Ali used to sing for his daughters. Ali weeps and I sing louder, lie, lie. My lullaby passes through the concrete walls, other prisoners Political or non-political or quiet, my lullaby soothes them, even though they don't speak Kurdish, some sob like infants, lie, lie. <laughs> Twenty. I count the cracks in the ceiling. My lawyer is presenting documents to the judge. Here, it is hard to breathe. The room reeks as if the walls were made of corpses. The judge leaves his seat and walks to the door that convicts cannot use. It's only for him, the attached light brown desk. Chia Salman is absolutely innocent, Your Honor. My lawyer says for the third time, He's not a part of any political group, Your Honor. Nothing in his judicial files and records demonstrate any links to the charges brought against him. There are only three of us in the room. Five minutes have passed by the judge, but the judge seems not to be listening. I wait for him to speak. He tucks some paper under his arm and walks to the door only he's allowed to use. I am going for my afternoon prayer. Your afternoon prayer? I shocked. I cannot help myself. He stops. I have been in prison for 545 days. The words jump out of me. For 112 of those days, I was not allowed to contact my family, seek legal counsel, or even know what my crime was supposed to be. 
The judge touches his grave ears. I imagine he has his dead mice there. Every step he takes toward the door makes me speak louder. My arms and legs tremble with pain as I lurch toward him, courtesy of the jolts of electricity. I was proven innocent of all the charges brought against them, against me. Why don't they let me go? They haven't even bothered to make up a single document against me. The judge does not heed me. Worms wriggling in his ears must halt my words from getting through. Absolutely zero evidence has been presented against someone, Your Honor. Zero, the lawyer says. The judge holds the door handle. He looks back, glances around the empty room, ends his search on the camera installed above this high chair. They ordered your death. There's nothing I can do, he whispers. And he turns his back leaving the room abruptly through his private door. My lawyer gapes, I scream, ah! And the scream bounces off the walls and back to me. The lawyer shakes his head and waves his hands in the air, only five minutes behind the closed doors and not even a word of explanation. The security guard runs and presses my wrist against my back. I wasn't speaking with my hands, I say softly, feeling almost numb. No, I will not let them kill me inside. After all, the high walls here can't stop me from seeing the moons and the stars. Being enclosed behind bars cannot stop me from knowing that out there Zagros Mountain dances slowly to the sound of the tambour. The cricket is my witness. She knows that despite the injustice in prison, the day and night do not steal each other's turn in their freedom. When I'm free, I will dance with Schler, with Leila, with my students, with my friends. I won't share the story of the walls. I'll dance with them. Dance. Dance when they're broken open. Dance. Thank you.